Hey, this is Mohal Joshi from Los Angeles, California. I follow Indian foreign policy and defense with a special focus on Asia. You can follow me on Twitter at Mohal Joshi. Hey, this is Kishore Narayan from Bengaluru in India. I am an international relations expert specializing in global security, conflict resolution, and international negotiation. My focus areas include peace building and digital diplomacy. You can find me on Twitter at Veggie Diplomat. Hello and welcome to episode 44 of India Rising Strategic Affairs Conversations with Mohal and Kishore, a show in which we analyze the happenings from around the world and their impact on India. In today's episode, we will look at the results of the recently concluded general elections in Pakistan and how it will shape the country for the next five years. But before that, we under- we got to understand the context in which Pakistan went to polls. The last time around in 2018, Imran Khan, we all know, was elected slash selected because of the backing of the Pakistani army. However, midterm, he was removed after losing a vote of non- no confidence in the National Assembly. This was the first time that any uh, uh, Prime Minister was actually removed midway uh, through a vote of no confidence. However, for the remainder of the term, there was a coalition government between PMLN, uh, PMLN's Shabash Sharif, who is actually the brother of ex-Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, and then PPP, uh, Pakistan People's Party's Bilawal Bhutto, Sardari. So uh, this was uh, two separate governments for one single term of the National Assembly. Imran Khan kept uh, accusing not only the army, but also the uh, the opposition parties that these people had stolen the mandate and had ensured that he uh, loses his uh, chair, but also ha- uh, was accusing them of uh, conspiring to send him to jail. Now, uh, although the term of the National Assembly ended in August 2023, there were constant delays. Why? Because the army wanted to bring back former Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif, who was in exile in London, and wanted to get him back into active politics. So the elections were postponed by six months, from August last year to February now. In the meanwhile, all court cases against Nawaz Sharif were either removed or he was granted bail, or uh, it was ensured that uh, there were no judicial slash legal roadblocks and paved the way for him to contest in the elections. On the other hand, Imran Khan was charged with multiple cases and was found to be guilty in at least three of these cases. Imran Khan, I mean, uh, we all know that he was jailed uh, on the basis of these including one of them which was extremely serious, uh, revealing state secrets, uh, and uh, this had a minimum of 10 years uh, imprisonment. Now, we had covered it extensively in our previous episode, episode number 41, when he was actually uh, arrested. Now, PTI, in addition, PTI, Pakistani Tehri King Saf, Imran Khan's party, as a party was not allowed to contest. After all, it's uh, biggest leader, the, the party president, Imran Khan, was in jail. His other leaders were also put behind bar, uh, and therefore there was no uh, top-rung leadership who could contest anymore. Now, its party symbol, the cricket bat, was frozen, and nobody could use it. So PTI had no other option but to ask its contestants to contest as independents across the country. Now, all media commentators political pundits believed that PMLN, that is Nawaz Sharif's party, would be the single largest party and possibly even reach the halfway mark. Now, this was the context in which people voted. And uh, Mohal, you want to talk about what happened exactly on the polling day? No, before that, I want to um, uh, talk about like the, the three cases. So I think one of mm. them was the Tosha Khana case, which was kind of for related to corruption, like accepting gifts and not declaring them. Mm-hmm. The other was, I think, the Cypher case, which was re- related to uh, revealing state secrets. 
and the third one which was was quite like the, the most flimsiest of them all was that his married with uh, his marriage with his uh, third wife bushara bibi was considered un islamic because they hadn't observed some kind of i think it's called iddat where uh, the women the divorced women is supposed to take a certain amount of break after divorce from her previous husband to imran mm-hmm. khan so i think this created a kind of sympathy wave especially among his supporters because i mean even granted okay there are always corruption cases in like in countries like pakistan and maybe the cipher case was also maybe had some legal standing but this was just like pure harassment in the eyes of his supporters where they just wanted to throw the proverbial kitchen sink at uh, imran khan to make sure that he doesn't get out of jail for a very long time i mean and and the the speed of with which this uh, all these cases come to bear uh, on imran khan was also kind of uh, surprising to many i mean shekhar gupta in his latest cl- cut the clutter said like the speed of these cases would even shame the most uh, Uh, biased uh, kangaroo courts uh, or military tribunals around the world like it was mm-hmm. like crazy like how fast he was uh, convicted so i think they were throwing all kinds of cases like personal like marriage was un islamic cipher corruption and i'm sure like there are i made one time i know i think we mentioned in the previous episode even imran khan joke that he had created because be him being a cricketer that he had a century of cases against him you know <laughs> mm. and in fact just before the election day maybe 3 or 4 days before uh three continuous days all these three cases he was sentenced to prison so uh, all yeah. these were all these were orchestrated in in quick succession in such, in such yeah. a manner exactly yeah. Yeah. that uh, people would know that uh, this guy would not come out of the jail yeah i mean and, it was so uh, obvious that i mean sometimes cases drag on i mean and see in also we have to remember like in parallel mm-hmm. nawaz sharif comes back and all mm. the previous cases and all, all the exactly, things, yeah. like you know are, are forgiven at the same time so it's such a big contrast that on one hand you're convicting like one of the most popular leader the prime minister which 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 what the deep state or the army doesn't get along mm. and in parallel this guy is getting so it's not like it, it cannot be it can be like not mere coincidence that one guy is getting off, definitely like, not who's, yeah. who's the who's the favorite of the army while the other guy who's no longer the favorite is getting convicted at a record rate in, in a wide variety of cases as we just mentioned and i think right. even the the symbol also is a big thing because like uh, for, see in a pakistan like uh, especially in like poorer countries like when literacy rates are low uh, mm. it's very important that the election symbol matters a lot you know i mean see even in india like i'm obviously we have much higher literacy rates nowadays but even like the uh, for example sorry i'm diverting a little bit like the ajit pawar faction and the uh, the the sharad pawar faction sure. are fighting over the clock symbol the right. the two faction of shiv sena are fighting so even in today's day and age like the election symbol matters a lot in terms of literacy and trying to figure out like so uh, i think like what you mentioned was that the uh, uh, they just made it harder they threw every kinds of roadblocks uh, on pti even like discussing about the pti was kind of uh, not allowed in all the electronic and print media so what mm. the, the supporters had to do they had to run a very smart social media campaign which the army was not able to block this time around to advertise yeah. about all its candidates who are contesting as uh, independents yes okay so uh, you want to talk about the polling day now yeah so on the polling day right in the morning the internet was uh, uh, suspended all across the country which right. is also kind of surprising that like why would you do that uh, right on the on the day of day. the election mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh i mean there was little bit of violence but i mean it's expected in any election like that but as the initial leads started rolling in uh to the shock of many including the pakistani army or the deep state it was seen that the pti backed independents were leading in a lot of states uh, not only in the stronghold of khyber pakhtunwa but also in punjab which is traditionally plmn's stronghold now uh, at one point i mean some unconfirmed report there's no way to confirm like the i think around 151 uh, seats mm. pti was leading which is like uh, i think it's like uh, more than the half way mark of, of yeah. the 266 so they would be on a uh, on pace to uh, give form the next government with a simple majority uh, assuming all the independents the whole flock stays together but uh, then suddenly in the night 
the voting the counting of the votes was halted across the country and uh, the shenanigans began i mean <laughs> i think like even uh, the media was asked not to report by the uh, unseen powers the powers to be were not to report on the results and the halting was un- inexplicably uh, stopped all across the country not just in one area if i am yeah. correct mm-hmm. so uh, by the morning i mean it was clear that they were changing the results in the back end i think there is this viral video where uh, a person is grabbing a set of unused ballot papers mm-hmm. and he's just stamping as fast as he can maybe like 10 15 per minute like you know whatever he can i mean this just shows like why especially like a country like india like we moved away from ballots because the booth exactly. capturing yep. you could just uh, stamp like 50 votes per minute and god knows how long you have been in that booth and how many ballots you can stuff down the box so i think there was some talk about electronic voting machines being used in this election but i think it never came to that mm-hmm. uh, step and i guess I, for a country like pakistan where army wants to call the shots i think they want to leave this hidden option of uh, rigging the elections uh, uh, open i mean <laughs> but nonetheless by that morning i think it was inevitable that they wouldn't let pti be the or the pti mm. independence as i say wouldn't be like more than half way i think slowly the leads which were like well above 150 or maybe let's say well above 100 started dropping uh and like uh, i think uh, kishore you can give the update on the latest results uh, what do we stand as yeah. of uh, yeah. today is like saturday evening in india time like what is the latest results you know we'll do that we'll do that yeah yeah so uh, so then suddenly people thought okay now that uh, uh, the unseen power unseen hands are actually involved in the rigging people thought that okay maybe this time around we will have a clear winner it may not be pti but possibly it may be pmln which might be uh, close to the half way mark however to everyone's surprise we saw that despite the massive rigging seen across the country uh it was still the pti back independence who had more uh, things to their uh, credit than compared to pmln we'll get to the numbers but before that i want to quickly share a uh, statistic now national assembly has a total strength of 336 out of which 266 are direct seats people vote for those 60 more are for women representatives of the parties which have won and these are based on proportional representation of the parties based on their strength the remaining uh, the remaining uh, 10 are for religious minorities so effectively the number coming up to 336 now up at this moment as we are recording uh, the latest number has per the state run agency news agency app are that pti back independence are at 102 pmln uh, is at 73 ppp is at 54 uh, ppp is bilawal bhutto sardari party mqmp which is the baloch party that is at 17 uh, jamiat ulama islami f j u i f is at 3 so uh, this is the latest numbers and pretty much the uh, pretty much close to how uh, it might end up uh, i think we have numbers for about 258 to 60 hardly around uh, 6 to 8 uh, seats are yet to be declared so more or less i think these these numbers would stay and it is a complete kichri uh, national assembly right now and no matter which way we look at it we will need some kind of a Uh, uh some kind of a uh, alliance government some kind of a national government and even yesterday or i think it was today early morning when army congratulated the people for uh, coming out in large numbers and voting although i don't know why they said that because pakistan historically uh, does not go beyond 35 40 45% in terms of voting percentage and and uh, the other yeah, i think uh, like other, Uh, so on the voting percent i wanted to add that uh-huh. i think as you correctly said it's like around 40 to 50 percent i think last time it was like in the just above half the uh-huh. interesting part here was that um, 
uh this time the reported numbers are still trickling in but it's about 70 percent so it's a massive 20 15 to 20 percent increase over what had happened and i think the interesting part is like i mean with the demographics like a country like pakistan i think 128 million people were eligible but interestingly one fourth of the electorate was a first time voter which would be hmm. like let's say between the ages of uh i think 18 to 22 or 18 to 23 ish uh, depending on when they register to vote. So this also brings up an interesting dynamic that the youth of the country is not beholden to like what the deep state or the army wants. The army. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. for them, I think the message that Imran Khan and his social media warriors were bringing out, it connect, it resonated with them to a large extent. And Correct. I think the, uh, I mean, it's early days, but I think what the early thought process among uh, commentators is that I think he has reason this uh, extra that 15 to 20 percent increase in voting has largely gone to PTI yeah. and the best laid plans of the army have been thwarted uh, by this youth bulge, which is uh, I don't think army had accounted for such a large turnout. So I think it's like a uh, affirmation of Imran Khan's popularity that even though I mean, practically, as I said, the kitchen sink has been thrown to him by the deep state, but he does remain the most popular leader in Pakistan, no matter how many cases. I mean, like like in uh, like a Teflon quoted image like right, you know that. Right. I mean, he might have not. I mean, we all know that he might have not run the best foreign policy for Pakistan or the best economic situation. I mean, he promised Naya Pakistan, which a lot of it didn't materialize in such, but he has a quite a hold, especially with the, the Gen Z or the millennials. And I think this, uh, a large, I think this is something that parties will have to take care that if the large percentage of youth uh, is part of electorate, you have to cater to them. I think there has been a lot of fatigue factor with the PLMN and the PPP over the years. So a uh, lot of people, especially like even like overseas, I've seen like you show like in United States or other places, there is mm -hmm. quite a bit of, I would say like for the lack of better term of fan following with Imran Khan's. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Absolutely. And it's like, there's no rhyme or reason why I think it's like, People are tired with the old to establishment yeah. parties. And I think he has caught the imagination of the uh, youth. So that's kind of interesting that this youth has driven, I think, possibly. And obviously, the social media, I think that's where the youth is anyways nowadays. Mm -hmm. uh, so they have uh, taken the message to heart and voted for him in a large percentage. Absolutely. So moving yeah. on. I... <clears throat> Go on. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, just wanted to add. Now, uh, uh... We think that uh, uh, Imran Khan's party made the best use of social media and digital media as well. However, it is also mm -hmm. to it is also to be noted that uh, PML and Nawaz Sharif's party somehow did not uh, come on board when it came to social media and digital media. They were they mm -hmm. were not they were not found anywhere, and they did not even campaign properly. They thought that victory would be theirs, and it was <laughs> just uh, on Feb eight. Uh, or, uh, they were the selected a mere formality. Yeah, that is what yeah, they, they were. The, they were the selected. Uh, this so they maybe took it easy, but I mean it shows like they are the old establishment party. Exactly, so they are, yeah. So even in India, yeah. like I mean in 2014, like BJP was and Narendra Modi's cash took the social media. I mean nowadays all they have them them IT cells so called, but like mm. they use the social media more than like the other establishment parties so in a way we have seen that the young uh, the youngsters have voted for pti not only in khyber pakhtunkhwa but also in punjab punjab mm -hmm. where uh, is the uh, where pml n is the strongest yeah and so kishore we have, uh, we have only I'm found sharing... that uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. So, uh, go, uh, complete a thought, but after that, uh, I'm going to share this image of uh, where all the parties... So, this is a image we are sharing from Al Jazeera, who is like displaying the, uh, the right. current lead. Mm. So, Kishore, if you want to go over that image and where everybody has been... Exactly, yeah, I'll do that. Has yeah. strong so, okay, we'll begin with Sindh, where PPP has traditionally been the strongest. PPP continues to uh, rule that state. Uh, and uh, Baloch, again historically has voted for the regional party that continues. PTI uh, last time had swept Khyber Pakhtunkhwa that continues this time as well. Uh, last time around with armies backing PTI had uh, won more than half the seats in Punjab and that had helped them to come close to the halfway mark. This time around 
people thought that PMLN would come back and win nationally in Punjab, in the state of Punjab, obviously because uh, Punjab is the largest state in uh, in uh, Pakistan in terms of population. So winning there would uh, would make it very, very easy for the PMLN to come close to the halfway mark. However, this time around, PTI has kind of uh, stolen a uh, maximum number of seats from uh, PMLN in Punjab, not only in central Punjab, in and around the Lahore area, but also uh, in the southern part of uh, Punjab, close to the Bahawalpur region as well. So effectively, we see that uh, PTI has made huge inroads into rural and southern uh, parts of uh, Punjab state. Mohan? Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, Kishore, like g- good points uh, for uh, sharing, like where are the regional strengths of all these parties? So now do you want to uh, elaborate more on the, I mean, we talk quite about Imran Khan and PTI, but can you elaborate on more about the PLMN and the PPP reactions and uh, right, right. what did they I do think, post-election? <laughs> I think it was a complete shocker for all of them. They thought that it can be another second inning for the coalition government between PPP and PMLN. So I think they all were shell-shocked. They did not know what uh, to expect. And essentially, everybody uh, took their time to come in front of the camera and give their opinion. Uh, Nawaz Sharif came out very, very late. Uh, I think it was uh, almost uh, uh, evening of uh, the Saturday on the ni- on the t- uh, 9th of uh, February. And he kind of gave a victory speech, but it was half-hearted by all means. Uh, he said that uh, we respect the mandate of the people and that people had voted for uh, PMLN. I don't know by what count. But he also said that he will be <laughs> sending... Chaba Sharif to talk to uh, uh, JUIF, uh, which is Molana uh, Fahlur Rahman, then uh, Bilawal Bhutto Sardari, Asif Fali Sardari, uh, his father, to make sure that they can cobble up another coalition government and try to run again, run the government again. So I think uh, uh, Nawaz Sharif is now focused on trying to get uh, to the halfway mark, making sure that uh, he can uh, cobble up all these numbers. However, uh, Imran Khan, uh, PTI, ensured that they released a video of Imran Khan. Uh, this was an AI-based video of Imran Khan, who obviously is now in jail behind bars, wherein he claimed that he claimed victory, point number one. He said he thanked the people for uh, reposing faith in him. And more importantly, he said that uh, people have now challenged the might of the deep state and have also rejected the uh, the coalition government of PPP and PMLN. So I think broadly speaking, Imran Khan said that, hold on, I'm still relevant. I may be behind bars, but with all these independents in the forefront, uh, it, it is very difficult for anybody to, uh, to downplay or to ignore our party. And therefore, uh, nobody can form a government without us. I think that was the kind of message that he wanted to give to the people of the country, especially especially the youth of the country. Mohal? Yeah, uh, good points uh, <clears throat> you brought up there. Okay, uh, okay. so now uh, you want to talk about how the army has been uh, looking at all this? Yeah, I mean, to just give a background, I think army did not forgive, forget or forgive like the events of May 9th that I think uh, we covered on a previous episode mm. of uh, India Rising. Uh, I mean, I sorry, I forget like which episode it was, but maybe you can elaborate on uh, that. Episode 41? Yeah, 41, sorry. So, uh, thanks. So, uh, basically, like where the PTI directly challenged the authority of the army, I think even the GHQ was stormed by its protesters. And mm. there was a, quite a shock that none... Never ever has there been a direct attack on the institutions of the army. In a way, uh, the, yeah, it, yeah. Sorry, in a way, that in a way that event or that incident was shocking, and I'll tell you why. Uh, mm-hmm. In Balochistan, people have uh, have hit back at the army uh, mm-hmm. establishment. That is expected mm-hmm. in Sindh. That mm-hmm. has happened. Expected in uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. That has happened. Expected. But nobody mm. had ever challenged the authority of the army in the state of Punjab. And on May mm-hmm. 9th, that is exactly what had happened. 
in Bahawalpur, in Lahore, GSU, like you mentioned in Rawalpindi. So I think mm-hmm. that was something that army did not want to uh, let go by. They they wanted to ensure that Imran Khan would learn a lesson of his life. And that mm-hmm. is why they not only brought him down, but also ensured that he stays behind bars for as many years as they could possibly manage. Sorry. Yeah, uh, I think... Mohal. Yeah, you know, very good point. So I think May 9th ended any hope of rapprochement, at least in the short term, because in Pakistan, mm. you never say never with all this, uh, like, uh, goings behind, like the whatever happened, who falls out of favor, who comes into favor. Anyways, I mean, so there was no going back. Uh, I think like the, I think we covered in the earlier episode that when uh, Pakistan, uh, I think when Imran Khan lost power, I think at that time there was a big uh, tug of war. Like uh, Imran Khan wanted to appoint his uh, own uh, favorite general, like uh, Faiz Hamid, uh, who was DG ISI to be the next uh, army chief. But General Bajwa was kind of opposed and he wanted Asim Munir uh, to be the uh, next uh, chief of army staff. So at that point, I think it developed a schism. And I think for a few months, Imran Khan didn't even approve that uh, uh, appointment, even though it's de facto considered that uh, it's army's domain on who becomes the new, new chief of army staff. And I think that uh, brought the end of the partnership between the army and the Imran Khan because Imran Khan wanted to call the probable shots uh, in this mm. case. And army is never going to let anybody call the shots, uh, especially like in foreign policy. And even during the Ukraine crisis, I think Imran Khan wanted a more uh, independent foreign policy. I mean, he could look at just East of him, like in India, where India has adopted a more neutral stance. But I think the army being pro-America didn't also want him, uh, thought like he was being too much of a maverick, as they say, and just wanted to bring him down. So people were silently watching and then decided like uh, in this election that they wanted Imran Khan rather than go this old uh, politicians who have been in like Pakistani politics for like, I think it's like almost four decades because if I remember Imran Khan, I think was first chief minister in 1984. Even the backstory is kind of interesting that one of Zia's generals uh, was very enamored with the Sharif family and uh, he wanted like, you know, they brought Nawaz to the fore. So, I mean, it's be, probably this is like the fifth decade very soon for Nawaz Sharif in Pakistani politics, which is like a lifetime if you think of it. So, I mean, there has been a lot of... Uh, what you call um uh, you know, in hindi we say thakan like you know with the old uh, same old politicians you know so they have mm. uh the people have been wanting to look at uh, change you know now uh, the interesting part is that i mean i mean see we, in pakistan then no elections have been free and fair except the 1970 elections and we know what happened that post the 1970 elections when mujibur rahman won the majority of the seats and the pakistani army uh, under uh, their army leadership refused to seat him uh, yeah. as their uh, Yaya Khan. He refused to uh, seat uh, the prime minister as a Mujibur Rahman. And there was a, a lot of uh, say, a reign of terror against the Bangladeshi people. And it obviously we know the history, what happened next, like it created later the creation of Bangladesh. So this one, uh, this time, I mean, like uh, this was also like kind of the forced election where the army wanted to, uh, were pushing for PLM. And I mean, as I said, there was ban on talking about PTI in the uh, electronic and print media. I mean, like Shekhar Gupta on his cut the club type had a funny anecdote. He said like, when the army is kind of the the first umpire, the second umpire, the third umpire, <laughs> the fourth umpire and controls the DRS, <laughs> it's supposed to win the game. But like, I mean, a lot of uh, commentators saying that Pakistan army has lost the game here that mm-hmm. they could not push their, I mean, this is probably the first time where they could not push their favorite to win the game, even in spite of some massive rigging, disqualifying an entire party. I mean, Imran Khan has like kind of dealt a blow. I mean, obviously it's army is not going anywhere in Pakistan, but they have like kind of uh, put them on the back foot uh, uh, with this, uh, with this, like, you know, this shocking result. I mean, and also like to just last to say like the new government, whoever they form, like maybe it's Sharif or Bhutto's, I mean, mm. they will not have the legitimacy because people know what happened on the night of the election day where counting was stopped and massive rigging was occurred. So it will yeah. create a lot of resentment on the street, whether that results into like a 
pro massive protests against the country is yet to be seen because i mean all the practically the entire pti leadership the top leadership and everybody is in jail or under arrest so it will be yet to be seen and also like the plmn to form the government they might also have to i mean there might be some funny stuff going on, like horse trading where the independents like technically they are not assigned to any party right so they could yeah. be bought off or persuaded or convinced or whatever you want to call it to join the new government by the army uh so it's like interesting to see what will happen in the days to come mm, correct uh yeah another thing that i thought uh, was quite important is that imran khan had a good amount of popularity in 2018 when he won the election although with uh, the backing of the army and it is safe to say that imran khan's popularity popularity has only increased and right now it is at an all time high despite all the dif- all the difficulties that he has been made to face i think i think that is one key uh, aspect in the political space within pakistan okay now uh, you also spoke about uh, the free and fair elections and how it was such a rarity in pakistan another thing that i wanted to talk about is how the extreme right wing parties came a cropper this time around uh, the the uh, JUIF, which is of the Maulana Fasl or Rahman. Uh, last time around, they had considerable amount of uh, seats, but this time around, they have very, very few. Uh, no, uh, I think three by latest count. I think uh, that uh, somehow people have decided that it's better not to waste their vote uh, on these uh, uh, fringe uh, parties and uh, instead have voted for the PTI-backed uh, independents. Uh, okay so this is about the actual political space within pakistan uh, mohal you want to talk about the global reaction as such yeah so uh, the global reaction from the especially the west uh, have been sending out like uh, i would say like mild statements rebuking the rigging but have stayed mm. away from any uh, from openly criticizing the results itself they have noted Correct. that there are issues with the mandate of the people but i mean i would have expected if there was some other antagonist country they would have put out a much more stern statement uh, calling out the shenanigans that happened like in this election with the rigging and stuff but they have and they're trying to walk the fine line they don't want to upset their partner in pakistan but also they don't want to uh, they cannot let it got scot free because everybody knows what happened and uh, the the role that the deep state had in uh, you know tilting the scales in favor of like plm and i mean and opposite to pti you sure also, also uh, i think we all know that pakistan will anyway have to go to the imf and world bank for more and more financial aid and despite this kind of a a handicap or this kind of a limitation pakistani army managed to hoodwink uh, the global powers the people who are watching and uh, managed to unseat uh, pti uh, pti backed independence uh, and uh, prevented them from grabbing uh, power so i think this has been uh, that kind of an open uh, daylight uh, robbery if you can uh, use that word and uh, i i i really doubt if uh, Pakistan will now be able to go to these uh, financial institutions worldwide institutions and manage to get any more uh, financial lending from them uh, simply because uh, simply because of how uh, their democracy is now more flawed than ever i think that is one thing that uh, uh, globally i think there will be ramifications for pakistan uh, okay uh, mohal what i what is your take on the entire episode now Yeah I think it will be interesting to see like what will happen already there are rumors floating that they might want to have Zardari as president and Nawaz Sharif as PM and Bilawal mm-hmm. as deputy PM so mm-hmm. I mean nobody knows I mean obviously the powers to be will obviously do their best to keep PTI away from the power but uh, as I said like this will be uh, fraught with uncertainties because uh, unlikely whoever comes in Uh, with such a fractured mandate is able to deliver anything major on there obviously there will be a lot of push and pulls within any kind of coalition government mm. uh 
I mean, with Nawaz Sharif also, you know, like he never. I mean, no PM in Pakistan has completed five years in office, and with uh, such a fractured mandate, it's. I don't think anybody is going to complain. Maybe in two years, three years, army will get tired of whoever it is, and we might have fresh elections again. And uh, you never say never. Like Imran Khan might be again like their favorite, or who knows? You know. So interesting to see. I mean, this is also the first time the legitimacy of the Pakistani army has been challenged. I mean, people are saying that this could result into an Arab Spring, which I still doubt because uh, Pakistan army will crush any opposition to it oh, uh, very, yeah. very, very brutally. So, but uh, interesting times ahead on our western neighbor side. So, Kishor. Yeah, Arab Arab Spring can happen in Balochistan and in. in, in. Cyber Pakhunkwa, but not in Punjab. Uh, army would not take it lightly. Uh, yeah. On the other hand, uh, it is also important from an Indian perspective to note that Nawaz Sharif made all the right noises in terms of telling that he wants a good uh, relationship with India. So even if uh, he becomes the PM now, uh, it is it is uh, it will be interesting to see how the Pakistani army will will they let him to uh, reach out and uh, have. Uh, reach out with an olive branch to India and will that be accepted acceptable to the Pakistani army? I think that was one thing that we need to watch out for. Uh, but essentially, I think all the other points that you mentioned, uh, political stability, uh, non-interference by the army, I think these are the ones that we keep, will keep uh, uh, an eye on. And uh, yeah, uh, we'll just have to see how uh, things unfold. Pakistan is that kind of a place which you can never predict upon. Yeah, uh, Mohan? Yeah, so I think uh, just to conclude, I'll say that there was this interesting editorial in Dawn, which the title said, The Day Pakistan Voted in Defiance and Hope. So mm -hmm. I think like the editorial says that uh, this was a vote uh, for the underdog by the electorate. And it was kind of a message being sent. But the thing is that do they, will the establishment get that this was a vote against the establishment? and a vote in uh, uh, for the underdog, which means that the establishment should get its message or like there will be, there could be like, you know, I mean, hidden between the lines. I'm reading that it could be trouble in the future, like if the establishment and the electorate grow apart, so. Okay, okay. Uh, okay, so I think that's all we had uh, in mind uh, for this episode. Uh, dear listeners, to continue hearing about such interesting topics, do subscribe to our channel, India Rising, wherever you are listening to us. If you are listening to us on YouTube, please press the bell icon to get notifications about new episodes. If you have not left us a review, we urge you to do so as it helps other listeners like you in finding us. We would also like to hear from you if you have any suggestions on any topics that you would like us to cover. Do remember that these topics should be directly related to Indian foreign policy. Until the next time, this is Mohal and Kishore signing off.